Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this morning's audit committee uh, meeting, uh, and a special welcome to uh, Claire Connor from KPMG, uh, who's joining us, and um, uh, no doubt looking forward to the meeting and the party afterwards. <laughs> welcome. I've got a dodgy microphone by the looks of it. Uh, are there any uh, declarations of interest in respect of uh, business this morning? Councillor McDade. Just to clarify that as we're all members of Action Partnerships, we don't have to declare an interest in that paper. Okay now, uh, it just seems to come and go, but we'll, we'll keep we'll keep going and see how we go on. Um, okay, so the moving on to item three, which is the minutes of the meeting of the audit committee of thirtieth of January. Uh, are there any comments on uh, the accuracy of this minute? Can we can we agree to uh, sign the minute? Oh, uh, Councillor Donaldson. Just just for the record. I think it's six. I've got the agenda of stuff, but uh, I think it'll be the same page. Number 44, internal audit update. Just to thank Jackie Clark for coming back to me. And this was a um, request for independent advice from other parts of, of, of you know, council services. And in actual fact, just confirm, Jackie, that in fact the actual number of external requests have fallen to 11 from 22 in 2017, 2018. Uh, that's correct, yes. Thanks. Thanks for that, Nelson. And also, can I just can I just observe that uh, in terms of the uh, training session to be held for members on IT systems, that did ind indeed take place on the 11th of uh, March and. Thanks to all, and the, indeed the cast of thousands of officers that attended that meeting. Uh, um, and But it was well worthwhile from our perspective, and we did learn a lot. So thank you for that. Councillor Donaldson again. Just very quickly, yeah, um, I was very grateful for that. Not all members of the audit committee could make that training session, but it really was immensely helpful, and I am appreciative to uh, council officers for the help they gave. Can I just ask, did the, the kind of glossary in the slideshow, was that circulated to all members of the committee? Because I think the glossary in particular going forward for understanding what some of the council IT systems are, I think it's quite a good, you know, uh, quick guide. Yes, I believe it was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so can we agree to sign these minutes? Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, item four on the agenda, which is internal audit follow-up. Jackie, can I ask you to talk through the report in your normal uh, fashion, please? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, the, uh, the appendices contain the, uh, the details of the actions which, have, uh, which were previously agreed within audit reports and which have uh, yet to be completed. Uh, there's six within the... Um, uh, within the appendices uh, for, for the current meeting. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions on any, uh, any of the, the content of the report, uh, and officers from the services may be able to help also. Thank you for that, Jackie. And, and, and I think a, an effort has been made in response to Councillor Wilson's um, uh, pleas at the last meeting uh, to, uh, as far as possible, uh, make uh, the uh, action points and status explanations in um, plain English as much as possible, and, and I, I notice progress made in that regard. Nevertheless, um, so, so thank you for that, um, and can I ask if there are any questions on the report or its appendices? Councillor Wilson. Morning, convener. Um, <coughs> thank you. Morning. Um, I'm on page 15, appendix 2, uh, just to ask, I've got several questions, I'll take them just one at a time if that's okay. Um, on, it's July 2019. I, 
agreed date is not going to be met. Um, I'm given assurance from the service that that should be uh, should be um, possible to be met. It is the date that the service has said is uh, reasonable for that. So I would uh, assume that to be the case. Thank you. The same question applies to, I think, Appendix 3, April 2019. We're nearly there, convener. Um, if, if we're on target for that one. I, again, um, in terms of the, um, the service, if you're able to um, confirm that the... Uh, the meeting of the Children and Families Division Management is taking place in next month. Jim? Yes, my understanding it will be taking place in next month. Go again, Councillor Donaldson. If Councillor Donaldson doesn't mind, I'd like to come in on that point. Of course. On the um, uh, Appendix 3, because I am concerned about this. The original report from personalisation was produced in March 2017, the final report. That came in with actions. We've gone through October 2017, March 2018, December 2018. So the finalised date we've now got is April. Uh, so we can be reasonably sat. Can, can I just ask, though, I think it, it's a relevant point, how it has, and there may be good reasons for this, how it has taken so long to come back on matters that are considered to be of high importance. It's not medium or low, it's high. Uh, really, you know, we can't be seen as toothless tigers on this committee. We really have to highlight this. It's now two years, effectively. Jim? I'd, I'd say part of the problem has actually been the turnover of staff uh, that were responsible for this area of work has been one of the reasons and the actual handover uh, that happened there has caused part of the delay and a bit of the confusion that's, that's happened. Uh, this has been raised with the head of service and they're now making sure that this action will take place by the due date that's been said. So that's been part of the, the main issue. Also the SDS uh, for the service is a small part of the service compared to uh, say the housing area so it's a, it's a smaller area but it's really just been the turnover of staff and the, 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 the handover issues that we have at that stage, really, is my understanding of it. I think the reason in particular, because it involves, you know, I think in many cases, vulnerable young people and about their future, and we've just got to make sure we get it right. And we get so much right on, on children's on services and uh, children's care. It just, this has been so long outstanding. But you say you are fairly confident uh, that April we should get. Uh, yes, no, the, the head of service is definitely making this a, a priority to make sure this is happening. And also the, the chief social worker, Jackie Pepper, is well aware of the situation. Yep. Th thank you. Thank, thank you, Jim. Thank you for that clarification. Does that answer your question, Councillor Wilson? Indeed, and I'm grateful for Councillor Donaldson's follow-up because I think it, was, it strikes us at the point I was, I was making. I'm on to Appendix 4 now. Um, convener on page 19, okay. um, Roads Maintenance Partnership, and I think this, to a degree the same question might apply to this one as Councillor Donaldson's previous question, but um, this seems, the two points here, it seems to be a, a kind of convoluted route because it was taken to committee on the 30th of November last year, going to committee in May 2019, and then back again in October 2019. I'm just not quite sure of the pathway that follows that through and why it would still take until November 2019 for us to get a result on this one. My other point is just maybe on the, on the text under the action plan column. It says Deputy Roads Maintenance Partnership Manager is Mr. Dial. Is he not now the manager? So the report's out of date, I think, um, eh, in, in that regard. So I think maybe been a wee bit of cut and paste involved in that, so maybe we could make sure we, we get the correct titles in them, um, convener. But uh, my, my, my main question is just to clarify if that timetable, which seems to me to be a bit extended, um, is absolutely necessary, um, given this, the, the, the fair length of this item. Okay, um, thank you for that, Councillor Wilson. Fraser, would you like to, to comment on that, sure. please? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the questions. Um, to take the, the in reverse order, yes, Stuart Dahl is now the Roads uh, Maintenance.
Department's partnership manager, so uh, the, the, the description of, of the effort she'd be taking out there. Um, my understanding is that uh, uh, there's a couple of parts to this. Um, the decision itself on the way to take the, 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 the maintenance partner partnership forward um, was uh, the decision on that was taken on the 30th of November. That was in line with the member officer working group um, decisions on that. That will then lead to a report coming to uh, E&I committee uh, on the, uh, uh, within May. Um, and beyond that then, I think the specific point is around about the, the obtaining best value review report, which is a, a supplementary report, which in itself uh, will be brought forward and confirmed by, by November. So I think there's a, there's, there, there has been a, um, a movement on it, and it, it's had to go through, I suppose, the political process, um, and, but there are actually two parts to it. I'm grateful for the answer, convener. As a member of the MAUG, uh, I feel some responsibility for the length of time the MAUG took to get to where it, where it, where it did, but I'm, I'm happy with the answer. Uh, thank you for that, and um, um, thanks for the response as well. It's uh, helped clarify the, the timeline here. Uh, Councillor Illingworth. Excuse me, can you put your microphone on? Thank you. Do you want me to start again? Or? Yeah, I think you're better, thanks. Okay. <laughs> uh, my question is about uh, Appendix 2, um, Authorised Signatory Database Update, and it's got uh, an append app importance of low. Can, can you explain to that? Because that could be an opportunity for fraud, but obviously I'd be happy to listen to, to your thoughts on that. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Going back to the original audit report, uh, the action, um, action point that was raised, the finding was that uh, the authority for entering into contracts was based on uh, an officer's revenue and capital spending limits rather than anything specific um, for, for signing contracts. Um, so it was recognised that this was an additional uh, clarification that could be made rather than something which was completely... Um, being missed. So it really was just an opportunity here for, for uh, getting a degree of clarity. Uh, yep, follow make, up. A, make a comment as well? Yes, of course. About Appendix 3. Um, it talks about SDS. It actually took me quite a wee while to work out what the SDS is self directed support. So if we can, can avoid. comes back to the overall point regarding um, uh, clarity uh, in, in these comments and um, uh, there shouldn't be an assumption that, uh, uh, that everyone knows what, um, what acronyms stand for. Uh, I do take that on board. Councillor McDade, did you have a question? Yeah, it was really a follow on from uh, Councillor Wilson's points around the Roads Maintenance Partnership. Uh, I was also a member of the MOG, so I have a bit of a background to this. And I certainly don't know if Councillor Wilson's recollection is similar to mine, but in the latter days of the MOG, there was quite a great sense of urgency that there was a desire to get it to committee as fast as humanly possible, basically. Um, and I think we finalised our recommendations prior to November. Actually, I sort of think it was around September time. So um, there does seem to be a significant time lag there, and I understand committee reports take time to put forward, etc. But um, I think certainly my recollection was it was pretty much the view was we were pretty much ready to go to committee because there had been um, you know reports sort of sitting in the back you know the, the, the document had been sitting there for a long time waiting to go um, and it was really just the decision we were taking was was that model we were continuing to go forward with and were we happy with that and the broad answer was yes um, so I'm just a bit sort of wanting to probe as to. Is that just due to the officer's busyness or time lag? Sorry, thanks for the question. Yeah, uh, um, I, I wasn't part of the, the member officer working group myself, um, but uh, you're right. In terms of the lead time, I think that, 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 that's one issue. Um, but uh, the May deadline is what's been, what's been set for us just now. 
um, I can certainly take, take, take that back and, and, and get back to, to in terms of why um, there's perhaps been a, a slight delay in getting it committed. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think in just in general, again, the, the point I would make about um, timelines for, for actions and, um, you know, the need for uh, for the committee to be confident that, that these are achievable um, and that's something that I think you, we just need to keep an eye on going forward and, and make sure that we are comfortable that there are no um, unexplained <coughs> delays in taking matters forward. But I think we've had, a, had clarity from the officer uh, regarding the circumstances here. Councillor Williamson. It was basically about the best uh, obtaining best value review. Surely that should be a, um, an ongoing process within the road maintenance partnership for every contract that's been awarded. They should be looking at getting best value from you. I think this specific uh, review is to look at um, um, to, uh, to arrive at whether we are, as a council, obtaining best value through the awarding of the works to Bayside contracts and, and whether or not we've got the balance right. Um, and I think that, that was the purpose of, the, of, of this obtaining best value review. Uh, it may have changed over the, the, uh, the couple of years since we were looking at it, but that was certainly the initial impression, um, the, my, my initial understanding, uh, back a, a couple of years ago. Okay, are we, are we finished on that? Any further questions? Can we agree to note the report? Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, item five, which is internal audit update. Uh, and uh, there are a number of um, reports that uh, uh, have come forward this month, I'm glad to say. And um, can we ask Jackie to commence with uh, an overview and uh, lead into the first of these on sales ledger. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, yes, internal audit's been continuing to work on the uh, internal audit um, planned activity for 2018-19. Uh, um, and good, good progress has been made um, towards, uh, towards uh, completing the plan. Uh, what I will say is that uh, from, the, from the appendices, you will see that there are still uh, gaps uh, as uh, for, for dates being added, uh, what I can say is that the majority of those gaps have been filled uh, since uh, the reports have been uh, considered by uh, through the pre-agenda process, um, and there's just a couple of uh, a couple of areas of work that we're, uh, we're we're finishing off this week, and I'm confident that uh, the plan will be achieved uh, by the end of uh, by the end of this week. Um, in addition to um, uh, to, do, to undertaking that work, we've also been working with services. Uh, through the National Fraud Initiative, where, where the matches have now been released, to ensure that uh, services have got a plan to take forward uh, their their matches, and I'll continue to work with, with with services to ensure that these are undertaken over the next uh, the next few months. Uh, in addition, we've been working on uh, on uh, assignments relating to the integration joint board, which will be presented at a future. Um, uh, meeting of the IJB's Audit and Performance Committee. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions um, uh, about about this, but the, what I would also like to draw your attention to is in section two, uh, we have um, uh, a paragraph there on an outcome from consultancy work. Consultancy work varies very much from um, uh, internal audit having an overview throughout the year to be able to provide advice and support uh, as required, or for specific pieces of work where services have requested us to um, to come in and do a targeted piece of work. Um, so some, uh, some areas you'll see uh, in, uh, you'll see more, more of these kind of paragraphs in, uh, in the, the update for next, uh, the next committee, uh, but for the, the current one, then you, you just uh, see what's, what's actually written there. 
uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, and um, okay, so can we take any questions at this stage in terms of uh, what Jackie has spoken of and in particular in relation to appendices one and two? Councillor Donaldson, do you have something? Yes, on appendix two, and I wish I'd pushed this more strongly at the last audit committee meeting. Uh, uh, in fact, I've got two questions, but the key one is on Alio's arm's length external organisations. That was going to originally come to audit in January of this year. We The assignment brief was only, as uh, I would assume it's now been approved, but it's not going to report back until the 20th of May, and that will be more than a month after the Policy and Resources Committee meets in April, and one of the issues there, I think it's well known, is it's been discussed before, is the potential merger of a um, cultural path in Kinross and Horsecross. So can I ask, uh, around, uh, Jackie, with the alleos, is that going to include all three of the alleos, Live Active Leisure, <coughs> Horsecross, and uh, as well as a um, cultural path in Kinross? And what is the brief going to be? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, this uh, this was included in the plan and was a, a small p amount of time to um, to be available for uh, for consultancy for advice and and support uh, throughout the year. So this is um, um, discussions that have arisen recently with uh, the relevant head of service it is leading to a, a more substantive piece of work next year. So this uh, the work that's been undertaken this year is relatively high level in covering governance. Uh, surrounding all, but next year we'll be bringing forward as part of next year's plan a, a detailed piece of work, um, which I'll be proposing to to undertake uh, for committee approval. Okay. Um. So we're going to get in May, or twentieth of May, I think it'll be, is going to be a high level piece looking at overall governance, uh, looking at. Uh, next year, we're talking a much bigger picture stuff, and be it a merged or a th still three separate organisations. There will be a bigger piece of work that uh, that's included in next year's audit plan, rather than a, a, a very high level piece, which was in, which was included in this this year's. So for the um, uh, for the the, the uh, audit committee in May, it will not, and these bodies are audited externally by, uh, by other auditors, but uh, it won't be within our remit to consider their own accounts. Uh, not as, uh, I wouldn't uh, yeah. have any jurisdiction over that. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Donaldson. Thank you, Jackie, for the re reply. Councillor McDade, did you have a question? I did, Convener, thank you. Um, it's around, it's on page 27 of Appendix 2, it's the audit number 18 stroke 06 and it's corporate governance. Can you, uh, Jackie, please tell us a bit more about what this audit will cover? Will it cover things like standing order scheme of administration, committee performance, or will it look on the senior management side or both? This is uh, an ongoing, again, it's another of the ongoing pieces of work that uh, I undertake throughout the year by contributing through uh, various policy groups and uh, policy and governance groups. Um, in order to ensure that, uh, that governance is in place. It's not, again, it's a, a, it's a small amount of work that goes into, um, into the audit plan for this. It's not a detailed audit of corporate governance as a whole. Um, obviously, coming up, we've got the best value review, which will cover that in a, a lot more detail. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, my contribution to uh, corporate governance. Okay, thank you. And uh, Lisa, I think you've got something to add. Thanks, convener. Um, it, it might also be helpful for the audit committee to know that um, the chief executive and I are quite keen that we're going to go through a, a whole scale review with a view to looking to get SIP for governance mark of excellence um, accreditation. Now that's actually quite a big exercise and obviously not one we do thrown in the middle of the budget or best value audit or things like that. But once that's out of the way, that will be looked at in a kind of whole scale and that will be looking at every aspect of governance from our leadership management and political right the way through to the nuts and bolts of our internal controls 
we are also looking at just simply because we need to align it to um, business, fit for business now, we are looking at the standing orders and refreshing them and making them a bit more clear because we've had a couple of incidents at, at committees where there's been a bit of ambiguity. So we're looking to tighten these up even as an interim measure, but there will be a whole scale review of the governance framework. Well, that's very welcome news and uh, I look forward to both achieving that mark of excellence as a council and the review of the standing orders. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McDade. Uh, um, are there any further questions? Councillor Wilson. Uh, thanks, Convener. A couple of points. I'm on page 27. Um, and just to follow on from Councillor McDade's point about corporate governance, this was due originally in March 2019. And my question is, uh, along with transformation, which was due in 29, March 2019, they're both now pencilled in for May 2019. Have, have we going to hit these targets? That's my first question. Yes, Councillor, we are. Okay. Um, and, and sorry, just before you move on, Councillor Wilson, uh, I think Lisa has something <coughs> to add again there. I think that we need to bear in mind that these are very sort of high level consultancy yep. inputs, but obviously since the plan was first drafted, we've got a new chief executive. She's talking about a different direction. We're starting to articulate about the Perth and Coombe North offer. So we are also looking at that, but it's, there's not much point in looking at something for, for a framework that actually may no, no longer be fit for purpose for us given the direction that we're going in. So it's a chance to do a sort of quick baseline, but actually there'll be much more detailed work that may feature um, in the forthcoming months. Okay, and um, uh, convener, I think that's a useful point that's been, been yeah. raised because it puts the things in context about dates. We can have dates here, but they can, they can change for a whole variety of reasons. But the purpose of this committee is to draw out why, why there's why there's reconsidering the extension of timetables. Um, my other point, which I'll try and frame as a question, convener, goes back to Jackie's introduction, where she said that the, the, the matrix here in Appendix 2 and the two pages had been populated a bit more since the, the pre-agenda papers. Maybe in future we could get an update if there's, if, if there's been a population of dates that would be maybe useful to the committee to actually have, have an up-to-date one. I understand why in the churn, of, of, of business, the, the date's gone, but even if it was circulated or tabled at the meeting, that might be helpful. That's a, a question, not a, a comment. Thank you. Councillor Donaldson. Very quickly, can I echo the comments of Councillor McDade? I think it's excellent that we're going for external credit accreditation with a sit for mark, mark of governance you do exercises like total quality management and so on, if it's not externally accredited, it really doesn't come to much. So I think that's really positive news. What I want to ask, final question, is <coughs> on the workforce planning, uh, it's just what the scope is there, that's due for me, but I'm just wondering what we're going to look at, Jackie, there, uh, what we're going to look at there, and I'm thinking one of the points I always find in the full audit in September is, look, uh, is looking at human resources and human capital. And I think that's one of the most useful things in the annual report and accounts. But we, we've also got the best value audit. So we've also got the best value audit ongoing uh, so it's just how these three things are going to link in together. Um, what, I, what I would say, I say, Councillor, is that um, at, at this point in time, uh, it's a relatively high level review of, of the um, implementation of the workforce plan rather than a detailed analysis uh, that we brought to our audit committee. Um, certainly going forward, we'll be taking cognizance of what is going to be done by, by our external audit colleagues and as part of the best value review um, so that we're not actually duplicating uh, any effort that would be going into any future reviews of, of the detail of the implementation of the, um, uh, the workforce plan. Okay, thank you. If there are no further, oh, there is another further question, Councillor McDade. Thank you, Convener, very quickly. It's uh, page 28, it's 1813, it's around workforce planning um, and the original date was due to be January 2019 
uh, it's now due in May. I'm just wondering if you can give us a bit of background, Jackie, about what that looks at. Is that following on from the budget? It looks at uh, staffing of the organisation. Could you just give us a bit of detail about that? Uh, it's really, uh, as I was saying, Council, it's quite a high level look at, at how the services are, um, are, are organising themselves to to be able to deliver on the workforce plan and the various different strands that come into that, um, as far as recruitment, retention, um, and uh, uh, and also uh, just ensuring they've got the right people in the right place at the right and uh, doing the right job. Um, and there's lots of uh, sort of aspects for that, including you, um, as we as as, you, as elected members, you'll have heard uh, the various different um, aspects of difficult to rec recruit posts. Uh, so it's covering a lot of so those sort of strands at, as well as at the high level, as I say. So I don't want to be sort of overlapping on uh, on what is going to be coming uh, and being undertaken by uh, other colleagues. Sorry, I phrased my question quite poorly there. Um, I meant to focus on the will it now that it's delayed slightly. Will it take into account the effects of the budget essentially in terms of achieving that? priorities that's been set down in the budget? It won't go into the uh, budget in detail because uh, it's the arrangements that are in place to ensure that the workforce plan can be implemented uh, rather than looking at uh, you know, the details. As I said, it's quite a high level, um, quite a high level review. Thank you, Jackie, for, uh, for that answer. And thank you, councillors, for, for your various questions on, um, on the overarching report here. Um, if we can now move on to the first specific uh, report on sales ledger, which is 51A. Uh, Jackie, can I ask you to do your introduction, please? Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, yes, the first uh, audit report is that of, um, of sales ledger, which is one of our key financial systems. Um, uh, the audit reviewed uh, three uh, control objectives, which you can see documented. Um, and uh, the controls have been rated as strong. There are um, a, a, a couple of uh, the three actions which have, uh, which have been agreed with the service, um, some of which have already completed, um, and I'm happy to take any questions or um, if uh, Scott Walker or Stuart McKenzie might uh, answer as well. Uh, th thank you, Jackie. Um, the, the one question I had just before opening it up to, to members was in relation to action point three, uh, and um, there seems to be a bit of confusion between the uh, A and B in the <coughs> action plan and the A, B and the C in, in terms of responsible officers and dates for completion, etc. Uh, yes, th uh, sorry, Convener, this was um, uh, an error on, on our part, so the B uh, has, was to be undertaken by two people, uh, so both by the team leader of housing repairs and also the business and resource team leader. So uh, in the management action plan, uh, it really should have read B and C. It's the same action. Thank you for that. Are there any uh, questions? Councillor Wilson. Thanks, convener, and, and I want to associate myself with your, your and Donaldson's remarks about the, the briefing that we got on the IT systems. I was hoping you weren't going to ask questions as audit committee members. <laughs> that's coming later. But, uh, thank you. Um, I now know concerto isn't something that's to do with the alley that runs horse cross. Um, on, on page 31, this is just in the middle of the, the box. They are testing a 37 sales invoices covering all three services. Showed six that had not been raised timiously. My first question is, was that a big enough sample? Um, uh, and six out of 37 seems to be, in inverted commas, quite a lot. Um, I don't know if, if that was a typical sample or, or, or not, and yet the, the strength of internal controls is strong. So there seemed to me a little bit of a mismatch in, in that. Maybe Jackie could explain a wee bit more about it. Uh, thank you. Um, the paragraph beneath gives you a bit of a flavour as to uh, as to um, why why some of, uh, part of the sample was not raised that that, that um, um, staff and management within housing repairs had actually identified that there was a backlog uh, that they would um, that they were trying to work their way through. So we're really sort of acknowledging that yes, there were there were there were some that were not raised timidly from 
from that area and another area which is within um, the, 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 uh, the action point. It was really just two areas um, that, we're, that we were looking at that, that we found that there were these issues. Uh, one got, was already acknowledged uh, within, within the service and one has been, um, has, has been progressed already. Um, with regard to the sales, sales ledger system itself, um, sales ledger can only actually um, continue with, with their uh, processes once the, once, the sales, once the invoices have actually been raised. But, but really we were taking account of the fact that, that the main service had already acknowledged that there was an issue there and we're working to, uh, to deal with it. Kavina, thank you for that. I mean, two sort of supplementary questions arise. Firstly, it seemed there was a bunching of where this, the sales invoices had been delayed because of a backlog. Is that, have I got that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, okay. there was uh, there's just two areas throughout the whole of the council where that was the case. And what actions are the services then taking to try and, if, if the issue is there's a backlog, um, what, do, what are we doing as a council to make sure that we, we don't have a recurring backlog? Is it, is it because it's, it appears that the system works, right? So is it we don't have enough staff or somebody was off ill or, or whatever? And what are we doing to try and prevent that backlog recurring? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure that I'd be able to answer that one fully. Um, this really yeah. is a, you know, a, a management issue for management yeah. to um, uh, uh, I think Fra manage. Fraser's looking to come in and Perhaps comment, thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah, um, as you see, the service has recognised um, the, the um, delay uh, in, in issuing the, the, the invoice, but uh, a procedure uh, has been updated within the service. Um, those invoices are now, the backlog has been, uh, is being dealt with. And I'm just looking at a communication that was sent out from the team leader to all those involved in the process, um, reminding them uh, uh, of the, uh, the time that's required. Um, and that has been acted on now. Are there any further questions? No. Okay, thank you. Jackie, if you want to go on to the uh, next report, which is, if I can find it. So it's uh, GDPR. Uh, thank you, convener. Yes, uh, this report was, the aim of this um, report was to ensure that the council is progressing with compliance uh, uh, with the new GDPR requirements. Um, there's a lot of commentary within um, uh, within the uh, the box that's in front of you, which will highlight to you that an awful lot of work has been going on within um, within the council as a whole and specifically within the service. Uh, I'm not going to sort of go over all the uh, all the uh, the areas that are covered there, um, but a lot of activity is going on um, and is being coordinated by uh, by the, our nominated officer. Um, there are, there are some actions which are arising from that, um, but w as a council, we're in a good place um, to continue with, uh, with implementing the requirements. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions, or um, uh, Lisa Simpson will be able to answer as, uh, um, as, um, as a line manager for the data protection officer. Th thank you, and I think uh, we've been provided uh, with data in terms of the uh, number of data breaches in the last 12 months, uh, which hopefully has informed members further. Uh, so thanks for sending these through. Are there any questions? No, no questions on that one. Right, okay. <laughs> Fine. So moving on then to the third report, which uh, is under Corporate and Democratic Services, Local Action Partnerships. Jackie. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. This, this was a, a review that was undertaken um, in uh, predominantly the last quarter of the year. Uh, there are two control objectives arising from this, um, one of which is a strong, as it's been assessed as strong, and one is moderately strong. Um, uh, David Stoker, who is here, who is uh, the service manager for communities, um, who sh uh, should be able to answer any particular questions. But there's just uh, two action points that are arising out of this. Thanks, Jackie. Um, 
And again, can I ask members if there are any questions? Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, convener. Yeah, it's, it's with control objective one about the delivery of uh, action plans for each uh, action partnership, which is on page 51. Uh, my concern is, is, is that we're, we're handing over the action partnerships across to a number of volunteers who probably have no, um, uh, I was going to say no idea, but that sounds cruel, but it, it's no experience of uh, delivering of action plans. And therefore, that, that might slow the, the, the progress of trying to deliver these action plans uh, for, for the action partnership. What I was looking for is what, what additional support is being given to, to, the, to, to the, the, the new batch of people who are taking over the action partnerships. Uh, thanks for the question, <coughs> Councillor. Uh, you're right. The sorry, the role of the role of chair um, has always been in, it's always been intention that community reps will take that on, but that will be still supported by council officers. We're looking at a training program. Uh, from May or June for all um, action partnership members, but particularly community reps around chairing and, raising and, and particular awareness raising around inequalities. Um, but the actual mechanics of writing the plan, you know, the, the, the work of that will be supported by people from my service. We won't be um, just expecting uh, the chairs and community reps to do that themselves. Their role is actually what are the priorities for this area, what are the key actions, what do we think we, we can do the actual writing and producing of the plan will be done by, by um, our, our team. Thank you. you follow up? Yeah, you, you mentioned there that you are going to give training to people, but will that training be taking place in Perth and will that be during the day? Because I'm quite conscious that many of the people who live on our action partnerships probably actually work during the day and will be unable to get to Perth for any daytime meeting. Yeah, that's always it's, it's that's a good question because we've we've um, we've tried various things in localities. We know we know it's difficult for people to to attend certain things, and quite a lot of the community reps are involved in other groups as well. So we, we've gone for um, we have gone for Perth just because it's of accessibility in terms of better getting and, and better do things once. But we're actually going to go for a Saturday morning, um, sort of late morning till early afternoon, and try to do something that weekend so work isn't getting in the way, and equally it's not taking the whole the whole weekend over um, and I think we'll be holding that possibly at the, uh, the concert hall. Yeah, I think that, that, that's helpful and, and here's hoping that that works and obviously if it doesn't then we need to look at al uh, other alternatives. Councillor McDade. Uh, thank you convener. Um, yeah I mean it's, very, it's an interesting report and um, I was slightly surprised actually to see the strength of internal controls as strong and moderately strong because whilst I think the, um, the staff and community planning team do a very good job at managing the money side and that the SIF and the uh, previously the participatory budgeting have all been very uh, successfully managed on that side I do f do feel as a, a member of an action partnership um, we have made significant progress, I would say, <laughs> very significant progress in the last year. Um, but, you know, I would have, st we still haven't got quite to the stage where I think we are achieving essentially what we're supposed to be doing, which is identifying the, the priorities we're getting there. We've now got quite robust governance in place that's going to allow us to do, to achieve, to actually identify the issues. And we've got that spread from the community. Um, but as I'm, I'm under the impression that basically in terms of setup, we're probably now further ahead than most other action partnerships in terms of community representation, etc. So I was quite surprised just to find you know, that, that, that it had been decided it was strong and moderately strong. Do you have any comments to make to defend your assessment, Jackie? Um, our, our assessment is based on, uh, on the evidence that is provided to us um, during the uh, during the audit, and um, and the auditor did have uh, interviews with some of the lead partners within within the council, um, and that's certainly where we've where we've come come to with our assessments based on the evidence that we've got. Um, what I would what I will say is that um, that we're very clear that this was not an audit of uh, of the activity of the action partnership. But is of the council's support to that, um, 
because obviously the action partnerships are, are a separate body from the council. So this was really very much looking at how we are supporting um, and, and hence the reason why the, the, uh, the controls are strong and moderately strong because there was a lot of good support from, from the council uh, in terms of the lead officers but also from the communities team. Thanks for that, Jackie and, and Lisa. I believe you've got something further to add. Yeah, it was just actually to, to add further to that particular point that Jackie made. I mean, this is an audit looking at the system of internal controls and the framework. Is the framework in place to enable local action partnerships to make good decisions and, and to deliver their outcomes? It's not actually an audit of what outcomes they've delivered today. It's about whether or not the systems and the processes and the building blocks and the frameworks in place to enable local action partnerships to to work effectively. Um, the next bit will then be looking at how effective the outputs are from local action partnerships in terms of how they decide to operate and what they're actually delivering on the ground. Uh, well, thank you, and I appreciate, I appreciate both your answers, and actually that makes sense. Um, it just reading the control objective to ensure that local action partnerships are identifying their priorities and are making progress in delivering them, I think there's maybe essentially a bit of a disconnect between what the actual the written control objective is and what has actually then been assessed so what you have explained makes total sense and absolutely i would agree with that but i think in terms of the wording of the control objective it didn't make that clear that's noted thank you for that councillor mcdade are there any further questions in that report councillor wilson thanks convener this is a question for for david and it's about why are we doing this question, right? Has this exercise done by internal audit helped support the work of you and your team on your constant improvement agenda? That's a good question. Right. Thank okay. you, Councillor. Um, members will know we had the What Works Scotland report as well and um, review of progress from main action partnerships. So I think this, this was useful again just for... So I'll use a, an Education Scotland phrase here uh, around sort of triangulating this. It was just to confirm actually the, the things that we were focusing on on the back of the um, What Works Scotland report and the improvement action that we put in place, the key things that we were going to do over the next 12 months. And actually having the audit team come in and look at that again was really useful for us, just to take a kind of fresh look at that and make sure we were on track and that we had the right resources in place and the right people doing the right things at the right time so yeah thank you that's uh, th thank you for that response and uh, i think that's very informative um to uh, committee members ahead of the exercise that, that follows today's meeting that uh, and i think it's something we should do more of which is obtain feedback from services that are audited uh, as to how useful they find it so thanks for that councillor wilson um, are there any further questions on this particular report? No. Um, okay, so moving on to uh, the, the, the final report under, under um, paper five, which is uh, carbon reduction and, and <coughs> climate change. Uh, and in this, Councillor Illingworth, uh, I know we have a five letter acronym here, which I can exclusively reveal is public sector climate change duties. Uh, so, um, <laughs> okay, okay. So, Jackie, if you'd like to give your report, thanks. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, there are two control objectives that were reviewed as part of this audit um, to ensure that the council has an awareness of current and emerging climate change responsibilities in regards to emissions reductions um, and there's appropriate arrangements in place, and also to ensure that council is complying with the mandatory reporting requirements. Uh, both have been assessed as moderate and as two, uh, two officers are here present who have a lot more detailed knowledge of the various climate regulations than, than I uh, to be able to answer any, any specific questions that, that you have um, in this regard. Um, but there are uh, three actions that are uh, within the report, um, uh, but a lot of activity is, is, got under is being undertaken and is planned to be undertaken, I think that's fair to say. Uh, but I'm happy to take any questions about the report or uh, uh, the two officers from the service will be able to help. Thank you, Jackie. And uh, as, as you say, we have uh, Mr. Marshall and Mr. Harris uh, in attendance to uh, provide technical input, I'm sure. Um, oh, 
Oh well, close. Oh well. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, Councillor McDade. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, it is uh, slightly concerning usually when we see reports of moderate controls down, um, and I wanted to probe a bit further about that in terms of, I think from my reading of it, it basically seemed to imply that perhaps parts of the council weren't aware of what other parts of the council were doing in certain actions, and that actually they might perhaps, I don't know, be performing better than we are able to report, or maybe we're not saying we're reporting better than we actually are. So I just wanted to clarify a bit around that. Uh, yes, I think that there have been elements of uh, silo work and lots of uh, officers have been doing things, uh, but not necessarily um, coordinating with, with the relevant people who have been undertaking the reporting. As a, a bit of a follow-up to that, do you think there is a lack of sort of knowledge throughout the council in terms of what is expected of the council in terms of this because obviously we have quite strong knowledge amongst staff about what they're expected in terms of reporting for qualities duties etc um, and obviously this is a statutory thing that we're required to submit information on do you think there's a lack of knowledge generally across the, the wider staff i think perhaps mr marshall can you uh, comment on that for us It's weaknesses that we identified in the report to the Enterprise and Infrastructure Committee back in 2017, which led to uh, our bid for a transformation project and the appointment. As a coordinator for the, for the project. Um, it also led to the setting up of uh, the low carbon board which has now been meeting for a, about a year which was specifically to try and get that message out and coordinate the activities across all the services because it is a cross-cutting um, duty it's not just the environment service so i think we've made significant progress there and i think we welcome the actions here which will strengthen uh, the work of the board in coordinating that you are right as well that uh, we need to look at spreading the word of what is happening in terms of the climate change agenda throughout staff but also members and as the new duties appear uh, through the Energy Efficient Scotland agenda. Um, that uh, the, the climate change plan the government's working on we're looking at um, I think we'll try and get you another microphone there. It's right. on its way, if you just bear with us. We're looking at uh, I don't think this is is that working? Yeah. yeah, we're looking at learning lunches and um, member uh, training sessions as well to help spread the word. So that it's a lot of ongoing work and one of the difficulties is that the legislation on this is under review at the moment and is emerging and there will be significant new duties for the council because the, the thrust of the change in low carbon is not just about our low carbon within the council, it's about the low carbon agenda across Perth and Kinross. So it's a fundamental shift we're, we're about to uh, see emerging. I think that's positive. And I think, I mean, I was aware of this through my other hat, as it were, but I certainly hadn't been aware of it through the council, as it were. And I think so having member awareness is important as well as the staff awareness, because as you say, there is significant increased duties likely to come. Um, and I think people might start getting a bit surprised when they suddenly learn what we're supposed to be reporting on. So I'm pleased to hear that there is progress being made in that regard. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor McDade. And thanks, Mr. Marshall, for your response. Councillor Donaldson. Yes, can I just follow up on uh, Councillor McDade's comments? First of all, the uh, states, there's a climate change workshop scheduled for March. Uh, just to ask, has that happened? And I 
and I can see from the nods that yes, it has. But I, I really want to make the point that uh, Council McDade's making, and it's the engagement of the elected councillors. Uh, one does hear uh, feedback on the Environment and Infrastructure Committee. I think there's an annual report on carbon reduction. But I just think we've got to be able to do this in more depth and for all councillors. Um, and I'm thinking in particular, you don't want to create more meetings, but I think there would be benefit from a, a really quite detailed briefing session on carbon reduction, on climate change, on, and it's only one aspect, very important aspect, on waste and how we deal with waste. I think to just engage and inform councillors. Just so your response, please. Well, I'll let Mark answer, uh, tell you a little bit about the workshop. But if I can say about the uh, engaging with members, we have had one session, uh, and it was, I think, uh, late in 2017, to which all members were uh, invited. I, I may be wrong with the date. And we are planning additional ones, but we're waiting to see what comes out of the Climate Change Bill and get clarity on what our new duties are. So it is is planned, and you know we'd welcome that uh, engagement fro from members. Also consider things like, should we be looking for members to act as champions for certain parts of the agenda as well? So we're, we're beginning to think about these things. But I'll, I'll let Mark say a little bit about the workshop. Thank you. Yes, the workshop was held on the 1st of March and we had 24 officers attending from across all services of the, uh, of the council, uh, going right from uh, technician level up to deputy uh, director of uh, service. Uh, and it was really, to, for me, as somebody new into the organisation and new to local government, coming from an energy background, was just to talk to and get get an, uh, opinions of people in the same room of what their drivers and barriers were to the low carbon agenda. So it wasn't to take an overall survey of opinion, but more get input from the, these actual individuals that were on the ground doing, doing the job. And we've got uh, a num quite a lot of data, which we can now, in the, we're now in the process of reviewing, which will help us inform the development of the plan and strategy development going forward. And going forward from that, as Peter said, we want to then take that forward to engage with uh, elected members and beyond that into the, the general communities as well because I think it's absolutely vital that as well as an organisation, if we're going beyond that, that we have to bring in the, the wider community of Perth and Kinross to, yeah. to buy into this. Uh, yeah, I th thank you very much for that. And I think, I mean, it, um, it is all about raising the profile both internally within the council and uh, externally. You, you can bet your bottom dollar that, that there's going to be uh, national focus on this area uh, in, in the months and years ahead and, and we need to be um, putting our best foot forward in, uh, in this work. So thanks thanks for what you're doing. Um, Councillor Illingworth. Uh, can I report that I got the bus in this morning? <laughs> thank, thank you for that, it's noted and I, I hope it was in time, was it? Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, good stuff. Councillor Wilson. I'm so pleased for David. That's <laughs> I get the bus in every morning. That's because the government won't give me a driving license. Um, don't go there. Okay. Convenient, you're right. This is an emerging and developing world. And I think Peter Marshall just began to give us the, the, the beginning of what could be a quite a lengthy cassette about that. But my question to the officers is just the same as, as, as the last one. Did the audit here help you in this emerging process? I, I think it does in this case because it's highlighted and echoed what we've been saying. And I think that in this format, it helps, helps spread the word across the whole council. So it, it assists us. Um, all of the actions that are mentioned are already in the programme. We've made some you know, progress with them already. Um, so I think, as I said at the initially, we welcome this audit.
Thank you. Um, are there any further questions? No. Okay. Can we agree to note the contents of this report in its entirety? Thank you. Okay, moving on finally to item six on the agenda, um, <coughs> the Perth and Kinross uh, ex uh, Council External Audit Strategy. Uh, and here we have uh, Claire Connor, as I say, from uh, our auditors KPMG, uh, and also Mr. McKenzie and uh, Mr. Walker, poised uh, to answer, uh, answer members' questions. Um, do you want to introduce your report for us, Claire? Yes, um, and just to sort of introduce myself, I am the new um, external audit manager for Perth and, Perth and Kinross Council. So this is my first year that I've been involved in the external audit process. Uh, Michael Wilkie, who can't be here today, he is the engagement partner. So I'll just take you through uh, the pages and highlight the main points. Just turning to page um, three, that's just where we sort of highlight what our planned work is for the financial year 2018 and 19. And obviously one of the main points there is uh, we talk about the audit of the financial statements. Um, other points to note are the completion of returns to Audit Scotland and grant claims, as well as um, the best value assurance report that we, will be we are preparing in conjunction with Audit Scotland. I've also just mentioned, the, um, we note also on page three who the, the members of the team, Michael Wilkie is the engagement leader and I am obviously the engagement manager. It is a separate engagement manager who will be looking at the best value report. That's Fiona Bennett. Um, so that will be the members of the team involved. Page four and five, we talk about the sort of key points from the report. Uh, we talk about materiality, audit risks, um, best value, what we consider to be the group audit, and independence. And we touch on those points uh, further on in the report. So I'll cover those then. Page six brings us on to um, materiality. Um, so materiality is um, states there at the top of page six. We're required to plan our audit to determine with re reasonable confidence whether or not the financial statements are free from material misstatement. So in respect of the council's accounts, materiality has been set at nine million pounds and it doesn't say it there, but I don't believe it's actually changed significantly from prior year. Um, and that represents, that £9 million is calculated, it's based on 2% of the adjusted 2017-18 gross expenditure. So that's the level that we will audit the financial statements to. We then mention at the bottom of page six, reporting to audit committee. And here we talk about um, effectively what is our de minimis level and that is £250,000. And what that means is any uncorrected misstatements that we identify during the audit process, any that um, management uh, determined doesn't need to be updated within the financial statements, we will report those separately to you at the audit committee. We also mention there, um, just at the sort of bottom of page six, that if management has corrected material misstatements during the audit process, we will also consider whether we should um, report those to you as well, whether it would be of your interest to know of those adjustments that have been updated. Page seven brings us on to significant risks um, and other focus areas. So the first two audit risks that we have, um, it's worth noting that ISA 240 makes these a presumed audit risk for all organisations. So they're not necessarily specific to Perth and Kinross Council. But us as uh, but KPMG as auditors, we need to identify these as significant risks for all organisations organizations that we audit. So the first risk there is fraud, um, fraud risk from management override of control. And as it says there in the why, it's a presumed risk we're required to consider that covers risk, fraud risk from management override of control, and it's a default significant risk. So as I mentioned, it's not specific to Bertha and Ross, it's, it exists for all organisations that we audit. It's just worth noting there that we do, we mention on page seven um, within the audit approach box that we have not identified any specific additional risks of management override relating to the audit of the council. On page eight, 
Um, our second presumed risk is the, um, the fraud risk from income recognition and expenditure. And this is a presumed risk, again, for all organisations, but for the purpose of the Council, this risk is also extended to expenditure as well. On page nine, we talk about our third significant risk, which is the re-evaluation of property, plant and equipment. So in, in common with um, other councils, the council has adopted a rolling re-evaluation model, which sees all land and buildings revalued over a five year cycle. We say that the council uses the evaluation date of the 1st of April, 2018, or the 31st of March, 29 year end in respect of all properties except those classed as investment properties. So therefore, given the time gap from the 1st of April 2018 to the 31st of March 2019, we need to consider whether there has been a, a, a risk of, mo of material movement in the valuation between those dates. So really what we're sort of saying is, given the quantum of the asset carrying values and the inherent use of assumptions in their valuation, we consider this to be a significant risk. I guess I'm just drawing your attention to that to again sort of um, emphasise the point it's not necessarily anything in specific to Perth and Kinross Council. The risk that we identify as a firm is more in relation to the fact that firstly the, the, the values involved are deemed to be material. They're greater than our materiality of £9 million. But it's also um, the use of assumptions the use of the assumptions, um, that's the part that we obviously need to, we use our specialists to look at those as well um, and consider if the assumptions used were changed slightly, how would that impact the valuation? Would that be material for us? <coughs> Moving on to page 10, we talk about um, retirement benefit obligation. Again, this is identified as a significant risk. Possibly worth noting again that this um, the audit of pensions, uh, KPMG, um, in, the, in most cases, I believe, does uh, would identify this as a significant risk. It's again down to the um, the the values involved, which are considered material, and as well as due to the to the um, the, the way in which the pension liability is calculated, it uses an, a number of actuarial assumptions. So again, we um, our pension specialists would be involved. Uh, to assess the assumptions used as part of the pension scheme and to consider um, whether, you know, whether they are in line with what our, pen our pension specialists would expect to see and any potential impact from changes in assumptions, what the value would be on the council's accounts. Page 11, we talk about another focus area, which is capital expenditure. Um, the expected spend in 2018 and 2019 is 17.8 million, which is obviously material to us. Um, and it's an area that we, it's not necessarily a significant risk, but it's an area that we will um, focus, we will we'll spend a bit more all of it focus on. And we'll make sure that the classific classification of costs between operating and capital expenditure is appropriate. Page 12 and 13, we detail some other audit matters. Um, it's just worth noting there on page 13, we talk about the group audit considerations. Perth and Kinross Council, TACTRAN and IGB are audited by the same audit team within KPMG. Both the council and IGB are consolidated into the group accounts. TACTRAN is not consolidated in the grounds of materiality, but it will still be audited by KPMG. Uh, and the charitable audit funds are also audited by KPMG, but that will continue to be the previous engagement leader, who is Andy Shaw. On page 14, we move on to talk about wider scope and be best value. So we're required to um, assess and provide conclusions in our annual audit report in respect of the four wider scope dimensions, which are financial sustainability, financial management, governance and transparency, and value for money. So below we've set out our approach. Um, I draw your attention to page 15. We, we state here that in 2018 and 19, Audit Scotland, in conjunction with KPMG, will undertake a best value audit of Perth and Kinross Council. 
planning for this has commenced. It commenced in January 2019 and we'll be reporting uh, no later than September 2019. This, the, the work that we will do will build on the work we've um, already completed in previous years and it will be obviously uh, finalised during this financial year and we'll produce, it'll be a separate um, report. Um, again, on page 15, it's just worth noting um, that we have not identified any significant risks in relation to the best, and when we've, we've performed our best value risk assessment. Page, page 16, it's just worth noting that from page 16 to page 19, I'm sorry, from page 21, um, details our risk assessment in relation to the best value work, our, why, the, the areas that we're focusing on, um, why we're focusing on them, and the audit approach that we're planning to take. We then move on to the appendices. Page 23 details the mandated communications with the audit committee. That's the communications that we're required to, to have with yourself over the course of the audit. Uh, page 25 takes us to Appendix 2, um, and that is Auditor Independence. That is where we, um, we have detailed our assessment of our objectivity and independence as the Auditor of, auditor of Perth and Penrose Council. Uh, and it's just to note that there are no matters that, in our professional judgment, bear on our independence which need to be disclosed to you at this time. Moving on to page 26, um, Appendix 3 has the audit timeline in there. Um, and the, I guess the, uh, similarly on page 27, which has Appendix 4, really just drawing your attention to um, the three key reports that will come out of our audit, our external audit process, which is the presentation of the audit strategy timed me out there. Um, the interim audit report, which will be presented in May, and that will summarise the findings from our interim audit work. And our independent auditors report, which will pre be presented in September, um, and that, along with the planned signing of the financial statements. Page 28 is Appendix 5, and is details the fees. Um, the, it's an expected fee is calculated by Audit Scotland for each entity within its remit and it's made up of four different elements which include auditor remuneration, pooled costs, contributions to Audit Scotland performance audit and best value and the contribution to the Audit Scotland costs. Appendix 6 is the, um, the, the group structure of the group financial statements and shows what KPMG core team will be auditing and the separate audit teams. And Appendix 7 moves on to talk about responsibility in relation to fraud. And really the key point to note there is, um, I guess, the sort of split from page 31, which we talks about the responsibilities of management in relation to fraud. And from page 33, which talks about the responsibility as auditors in relation to fraud. And then that takes us through to page 36, which is Appendix 9, KPMG's Audit Quality Framework. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for an extremely thorough run through uh, your paper. Uh, much appreciated and thanks for the uh, added clarity that you have provided. Uh, as I said at the start, um, I, I'm sure Claire uh, will answer any questions members have. Also, we have uh, Stuart and Scott here, um, should they be um, needed to comment also. Uh, and I think Councillor McDade is first off the blocks. Thank you very much, Convener. I've got two questions. Um, the first one is on page uh, 19. It talks about changing landscape for public financial management. Scottish public finances are fundamentally changing, significant tax raising powers, new powers over borrowing, reserves, responsibility for living, social security benefits, etc. Um, so within that, will you look at things like whether 
the government obviously gave the council the ability to raise council tax to 4.79 percent. Uh, will you be analysing whether if the council rises raises council tax significantly, whether that has an impact on the level of payment, i.e. whether there will be a reduced number of people able to afford to pay the council tax, whether that would have an impact on our income. The second point is on page 20, um, and it's around governance and transparency. Uh, it says we will obtain and review minutes of meetings of the various committees to assess the level of transparency and consider the council's plan for enhancing transparency. Um, the minutes tend to be quite abbreviated, but we do have recordings. Will you be watching the recordings as well? Thank you. Um, I mentioned earlier, in terms of the base value work, I'm personally not involved in that piece. It's, um, it will be um, Michael Wilkie, who's the engagement partner, and Fiona Bennett, who is the other audit manager that will look specifically at that area. Fiona was previously the audit manager here last year. Um, those two points I will take away, obviously neither is here today, I will take those two points away and we'll answer those and we'll come back to you if that's okay. That's great, thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, are there any further questions? Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Convener. Thanks again for the presentation. I mean, this in a way is a starter for 10, I think, in, in, in leading the way in what, what, what's about to happen. And I suppose what we're looking for, Convener, is assurance, right? Assurance that the, the books are okay, that the, the finances are sound, etc. Um, and you've given us, I think, two keynote points. One was in terms of the best value report, that the work so far has identified no significant risk with, I'm, I'm quoting back the word to you, is that, is that correct? Yes. Um, and I think, secondly, you're looking back in previous years to record that the, your, your, your view on the f up until now the management of finances in the council have been sound, is that a, is that a correct interpretation of what you said? It is, yes. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to clarify because I think that the audit doesn't come as some sudden piece of information all at once. It comes as a series of traffic lights, if, if you can call them that. And I think the, this is significant that it highlights a couple of important traffic lights. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Councillor Donaldson. Okay, um, I have two, possibly three questions. First of all, a very straightforward one, and that's on timelines. Uh, clearly, the best value report, the interim best value report, comes to the audit committee on the 26th of June. The draft, the draft annual report and accounts, uh, are they? When are they available? Is that uh, 22nd of May or 26th of June? 22nd of June. That's when we bring the draft on audit accounts to the audit committee. 22nd of of June. Oh, 26th of June, right. Tw sorry, 26th of June, sorry. It's oh the end right. of June when the draft accounts come to the audit So the draft accounts plus the best value report, what, no? No, they're two separate exercises. The best value report will come, I think, back to Council in June for comment, but I don't think it'll come to the Council till later on in the summer. All right, but I mean to this committee, when? I, I'm not aware of the best value audit coming to this committee. Oh, that is not going to come to audit committee. That will go to full council. Yeah, that's a separate exercise, yeah. All right. Um, it's just because it's called best value audit. You make the assumption it will come first to audit committee, right? There's a statutory audit, which uh, the audit strategy really con considers, and there's a best value audit, which will run sort of in parallel, but slightly different timelines. Follow up. Um, the draft accounts come 26th of June. I think on a number of things, for instance, capital expenditure, there's one or two other items, probably one wants to hold until one sees the actual data, the figures. But one key big ticket item is pensions. I haven't asked the finance team in pensions for a long time. But I just want to clarify, the triennial evaluation doesn't come up until, uh, the new one will not apply until what, March uh, 2020. So we will, for this audit, be working on the same actuarial assumptions. So the, am I right in saying that the 
the only big swing factor is going to be probably the value of the underlying investment. Yeah, thank you for your question, Councillor Thompson. Um, sorry, is that working? Oh, that is working. That's correct. Yeah, the uh, effectively the assumptions in the triennial evaluation we roll forward will be based on projections. Um, I can assure you, uh, I think I can assure everybody, um, all our active members that our, our net pension liability will move um, from what it was last year. But it will be based on estimates, and the most significant factors will be the underlying um, valuations, as I said. Okay, because one of the key factors last year was actually, and it was quite a surprise, was the reduction in life expectancy. And I, I don't think anyone really uh, anticipated that, but that, uh, but that was quite important. The final question I have is on page four. We state. We consider the revaluation of property, plant, and equipment to have the greatest effect on the overall audit strategy, so on and so forth. Is that um, a specific, particular focus this year, or is that just an ongoing uh, stress within the, the audit strategy? Sorry, was that page four? Pa page four, yeah. We consider the revaluation of property, plant, and equipment to have the greatest effect on the overall audit strategy. Uh, is that j just normal within, or is that a, p a special uh, st uh, focus this year? It was a it was a, an area that we focused on similarly in the prior year. Um, I think we're just I guess. We're just drawing attention to it there. Obviously, we're sort of seeing um, the management override of controls. Is, um, I'm not sure. Let me take it away just to see why we've sort of specifically drawn that out as opposed to also drawing out the pensions point, if I can confirm that. In part, I, I find it's <coughs> quite a difficult area with council accounts because, you know, with companies, you, you deal with depreciation with council finances. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a different way of doing things. I think, I anyway, think that's Mr. M Mr. McKenzie, there's maybe something to clarify. Thank you, convener, and, and in fairness to, to, to Claire, who this is an issue she's not had her first year of engagement with us. Um, there's a little bit of background to this. We, we've been, uh, have spent some time over the last two years um, on the valuation of uh, property plan and equipment with our external auditors. It has been a focus for them previously. So. This is just building on, on prior years' work. Okay, thanks. Are there any further questions in this report? Oh, okay, Th thank you, Claire. Thank you very much for, for your presentation uh, and for, for the clarity uh, of, uh, of your comments. <coughs> and so th that um, draws to a conclusion uh, this morning's meeting. Um, I do just have to place on record my continuing disappointment about the technology in this room. Um, so many of these microphones are uh, dodgy. I think we need to get a job lot of batteries in. Uh, and have an and audit of that, convener. Thank you. Uh, and also, I just have to place on record that um, uh, last the last meeting of the audit committee um only 20 minutes of it managed to appear uh, on on youtube so <laughs> they're, out, they're out to get me um, um <laughs> so uh you know, th there is an issue regarding the, um, the uh, reliability of uh, of youtube on occasions as well um, but I'm assured that today's uh, meeting uh, is being recorded and you can look forward to uh, watching that in, in due course if, if you're struggling to sleep. Uh, <laughs> but no, th um, th thank, you, thank you very much uh, for your attendance this morning and um, look forward to um, joining with colleagues in um, the meeting room adjacent to the building, uh, to, to the chamber um, in a few moments' time to discuss um, and review uh, the performance of ourselves and, and um, challenge ourselves on, on how uh, the audit committee can be improved going forward. Thanks. <laughs>